Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our first live streamed edition of Pachakacha on Ulster Call Online. I'll kick things off by introducing the Pachakacha concept. Pachakacha is a Japanese translation for chit chat and is a storytelling format where a presenter shows 20 slides for 20 seconds each, so a total of six minutes and 40 seconds per presenter. The presentation format was devised by Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham of Klein Dytham Architecture. And the first Pachakacha night was held in Tokyo in their gallery slash lounge slash bar slash club slash creative check -in, uh, kitchen called Super Deluxe in February 2003. Why the format? Because they found that architects talk too much. Pachakacha is now present in 1,234 cities globally and has over 23,000 presentations online. At Ulcer Call, we started our Pachakacha journey in 2018 and are delighted to be part of this wonderful and inspiring global experience. Now for tonight's theme. The practice of imperfection is based around the concept of wabi-sabi, embracing the imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. Often associated with a metric for aesthetic and a source for life's toughest questions, wabi-sabi is a multidimensional and elusive concept that is directly linked to a state of mind rather than a practice per se holding the beauty of imperfection at its core. If we were to appreciate the cracks and chips of everyday life, would that help us with the new normal? We've reached out to our network of artists and creatives, and we've asked them to talk about imperfection based on their own beliefs, experiences, and the current context. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Zainab Al-Hashmi, an artist based in the UAE and represented by Leila Heller Gallery, Farah Kabir, a mindset shift expert who helps individuals and corporate corporations become super achievers through the mystery of the mind. Joining us from Norway, we have Zach Denfeld of the Center for Genomic Astronomy and Co-Climate, whose project New National Dish will go live on Ulster Call Online later this month. We have Kohei Aramaki, a contemporary dancer who is part of the SEMA Contemporary Dance Company on the Avenue. Nima Nabavi, an artist based in the UAE who is represented by the Third Line Gallery. We also have our upcycling guru, Rania Kanan, who is co-founder of Cave and Chair Cycles. We have Dubai-based Walid Shah, a photographer and the author of Rock Your Ugly. And finally, we have Professor Camillo Serro from the College of Architecture, Art and Design at the American University of Sharjah. Before we get started, I invite you to connect with us on our social media channels at Ulcercal Avenue on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, just a little note here, the speakers will be presenting back to back, so we'll see you again at the end of the presentations. Time to get things started. The stage is all yours, Zainab. Zainab, you need to unmute yourself, please. Um, so I have been uh, speaking about uh, art and imperfections. So uh, the artist, uh, uh, Tim should have said that uh, in his work, all we have is words, all we have is worlds, which is we are our words and we are our worlds, which uh, let me understand more and took me into the idea of linguistics and language. We have been, um, using language for the past uh, one million year, I would say, through my research. And uh, through language, our language has started to become uh, more elaborative. And we have created uh, more dictionary and a bigger vocabulary. Um, and therefore allows us to see that uh, in, through our language, we have created different perceptions, different symbols, and different understanding of what language means to us. Um, I would say that uh, through the language, uh, we have also created the difference between the mind and the brain, which is uh, the brain is an organism and the mind is actually our thoughts, which led us to the thoughts that we create today is our reality. Um, again, this is uh, the mind, uh, the brain is a mind, is a meaning making machine and the mind always attracts um, 
what 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 uh, we perceive and what we understand through our the sim our symbols and collective um, perception. Um, Looking at uh, the concept of wabi-sabi also uh, links us to other symbols like uh, Ouroboros, uh, which are very similar symbols, but their meanings are very different. Wabi-sabi speaks about imperfections, where Ouroboros speaks about uh, birth and uh, death and rebirth. So again, um, we have created so many symbols over the years. We have created different um, uh, meanings to those symbols, whether it is Om or the flower of life and the Kabbalah, which comes from uh, different uh, traditions or the Islamic art, which takes us to uh, geometry and uh, understanding geometry through nature, uh, looking at uh, our similarities, uh, which led me to the question of what is really imperfect and how could we look at the imperfections in life as total perfections. Looking at what the, the similarities of the brain cells and how similar our galaxies are, um, takes us to also looking at uh, other dynamics of nature and other uh, ways of creating art uh, through uh, understanding nature and applying sacred geometry, which is from nature, uh, through our arts architecture and also our uh, our day-to-day perception and understanding of uh, uh, what sort of uh, situations happen in our life as they are good or bad, right and wrong. Uh, so we always give meanings to what is, uh, what is happening to our life through, um, through really an understanding of, of, of uh, how we would like things to happen rather than looking at things as they are. Uh, so here I'm looking really and comparing all of the perfections in life and how uh, nature itself, we are part of nature and we are not against nature. It is only our thoughts that are against nature. And looking how artists like uh, Leonardo da Vinci have, uh, which is not, again, it is not his own concept, but he has used the idea of the golden ratio. He used the, uh, and he's called it the divine proportion which he's used it in his, all of the paintings he has created. And then it became like a Renaissance, uh, uh, sort of like a Renaissance movement of using the divine proportion uh, in the paintings, which gives this uh, total harmony to the eye. And it starts becoming uh, extremely appealing to, uh, to the way we perceive this. Um, I am sharing here a personal story of imperfection, which is my car accident and the, the outcome of uh, my own uh, imperfection, which is the fractures and the body imperfections. Uh, and uh, speaking of, of this, which allows a lot of uh, mental and physical stress and uh, trying to always look back into how any moment before that incident and trauma was quite uh, more perfect rather than what is after it. And over here, of course, the mind plays a lot of certain games uh, towards what is perfect and what is not. But again, I can really relate it to the idea of uh, Kintsugi, which uh, speaks about the golden repair. And, and I compare this sort of uh, application of art towards the application of medicine into the body. And I think this is how uh, my journey has started of uh, seeking perfection in my designs and my, in my, um, in, in most of my projects, I always look and dig into uh, understanding geometry on different levels. And I think the way our body has been created is through geometry. If, it, if there is a language that we need today to, to understand more, it is the language of geometry, um, which allows a big uh, diversity of creation. I would say a lot of artists, architects, uh, craftsmen, scientists, and uh, scholars have worked with geometry uh, on so many different levels. And uh, through my work, uh, every time I try to explore and tell a story, I find myself digging deeper and going back towards uh, the idea of perfection, 
Although again, it's it's just an appealing uh, vision to the to the eye. It is not really perfect in any way. It's just again, I would say uh, the the way the mind is trying to seek into perfection. And uh, I guess uh, I'm just trying to invite everyone over here to accept and allow things to be, and for us to be imperfectionists. And uh, over here is just an image of my bone uh, perfectly healing again. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Hi, good evening or well, good morning, depending on when you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Farah Kabir. I'm a mindset uh, expert a speaker and a trainer. Um, we help cooperation and individuals become super achievers through the mastery of their mind. By changing thought patterns, we program in beliefs that are creating sabotaging, sabotaging forgive me, behaviors, uh, mainly new, using neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to rewire itself. And one of the biggest part of our work is helping our client correct in misconceptions and disconnection between what they want and how they perceive themselves. One of the reasons is because many of the core beliefs that control our perception haven't been set by us, but rather instilled by our families, authorities, so it's so, so, and the trois, so social norms, media, etc. And um, it has been the biggest part of my journey to find the own perfection in my own misconception as an adopted child that didn't have the same notion of self-identity as others. And growing up, I felt very disconnected and different from everything and everyone around me. And because of my appearances, where I grew up, I, I was automatically boxed in as a minority and treated accordingly. So in my search of being accepted by others, I tried to change myself. I'm 16 in this picture. I'm wearing blue lenses. You probably can see it. I'm trying to straighten my hair and turn myself into blonde, not understanding that I could only turn orange. But no matter how much I was trying, um, I was only sure that I didn't belong, that I was worthless. So in 2003, with nothing to lose, and nothing to my name, I came to Dubai as a last hope. And there I was in this magical city with skyscrapers popping up all over and a reality where every colors and shape and languages and background live in harmony. It was the very first time that I had experienced not being judged by the others. But what I didn't know is wherever you go, you take yourself with you. And as I was meeting people from every spectrum of the earth, every time I had the question, where are you from? It brought immediately a deep sense of emptiness. Everyone had a story, an identity, a culture, an attachment, a resemblance to their tribe. How could I be or become anything if I don't even know who I am? And in a moment of sheer despair, what I was looking for courage to end it all because I see, I saw no ending for me. Two words came screaming at me, my own name, the only thing I actually liked about myself by then. It had the greatest meaning and until then I never realized it. See, Farah Kabir means the big happy. That's who I am. That's who I was going to create. I was going to create my, my own identity. Who said that I had to be defined by a country or color? I was creating my own concept. I was looking at myself and at my life and nothing had made more sense than that. I wasn't in despair because I was adopted, but because I had adopted their perception of me as mine and I was determined to change that. And as often as I say, ask and you shall get, I had to rewrite my story, who I am and what I was made of. Yes, I don't have the same identity as others, but who says that makes me less than others? Yes, I have an exotic look, as they used to say, but does that mean being ugly? Yes, I was homeless, but that doesn't mean that I have to be worth nothing. And I was determined to heal and sort myself out. I was literally swallowing everything coming my way, from spirituality to new age modality to NLP to human behavior, traveling the world in search of answers and the secret of the human mind and the human behavior. And as I was doing so, not only was I transforming, but my life was completely changing. I became a force to be reckoned by. I went from being homeless to owning my own business at the age of 28. And my life was fully transforming as I was transforming and embracing and accepting everything that I was. And that's the funny part is that most of our challenges don't even come from what has happened to us, but from the way we perceive ourselves. And those perceptions are not fully conscious. Our conscious mind which is the tip of the iceberg here is only 12%. And yes, it has the ability to be analytical, but our analysis comes from what is stored in our subconscious belief. And for most of those beliefs, they don't belong to us. They have been instilled from the moment we're born by our surrounding. 
as human beings, we are designed to fit in. So we take their beliefs as ours and we often design ourselves in our lives based on societal norms made to fit others' expectations and approvals. And that is what creates self-judgment, insecurities, a sense of not being good enough or simply enough. And the secret to empowerment is to become your own loving friend and accept yourself exactly as you are and find the strength and the beauty in your flaws. Because I wasn't damaged because of my incomplete story. I was damaged because I perceived myself as such. And the interesting part is that no one perceives an objective reality because our brain is wired to prove itself right. We always have evidence for the thing we believe and those beliefs are often not ours. It is what is called in the brain, the reticular activating system. Our brain is wired to, to find what it's already looking for. You only perceive what is activated in your mind and your brain will automatically sort out and filter and dismiss everything that is contradictory to it. So imagine how powerful you can be if you fully accept yourself and fully accept everything that you are. Because the ultimate truth is that you always have been perfect, that you always have done the best with the filters that you have. And it's time to erase societal norms, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, and accept ourselves, our norms, and create our new normals for ourselves. For we and you have always been magnificent through every step of your evolution. And we're gonna keep on growing and changing and evolving because it's it is the only constants in life. And it's only through the full acceptance at every stage of ourselves that we will find our perfection through every stage. Embracing our imperfection not only makes us relatable, but brings our own significance and makes us lead by example. As in our, perfect, our imperfections, <laughs> we create the perfect individual as there always and will only be only one of you. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, uh, very honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Zach Denfeld and I'm gonna tell you about a project I've been working on since 2011 called Smog Tasting. So I've been working with artists, designers and scientists uh, to try to taste the air pollution uh, in cities around the world. And we use egg foams to harvest air pollution so that smog from different lo locations can be tasted and compared. And the project started um, as a workshop in Bengaluru, India. We were teaching a workshop at the Shrishti School of Art, Design and Technology. And we wanted to get outside the classroom and activate our bodies, get away from the computers. Um, and we wanted to, to experience air pollution in a way that wasn't passive, but was active. And uh, luckily we were reading a book called On Food and Cooking by Har Harold McGee. And we ran across an amazing quote that said, thanks to egg foams, we are able to harvest the air. At stiff peak stage, egg foams are 90% air. And we realized that this was a way of taking a snapshot uh, of the air around us and tasting it. So what is smog? Um, it's a kind of air pollution that is both intense and visible. Uh, and it's produced from different pollutants, for example, um, automobiles, coal-fired power plants, and animal manure. Um, and there are many uh, types of smog around the world. So there's the sort of photochemical smog that one experiences in Los Angeles, and the sour smelling smog uh, from industrial farms where manure and pesticides interact. Here you can see our class uh, harvesting air uh, pollution and bringing it back to the kitchen to cook with. And uh, you can actually taste and smell um, smog, but smog also makes your taste and smell go down, which is one reason all over the world uh, street food is so spicy and pungent. Uh, we've taken this project uh, with us where we travel, but also shared it across the internet. Uh, and here, a journalist in Bogota, Colombia, asked um, if she could use the uh, project. And of course, we were happy to share that. Uh, and based on that work, we've taken smog tasting to at least five continents that we know of. Uh, so you can see a map of some of the sites here. Um, and we started working with a journalist named Nicola Twilley in 2015, who coined a new phrase called airwar, which builds on the sort of food studies term of terroir, which means how the land affects the taste of food. So airwar is how the air affects the taste of food. Um, and so you can imagine uh, not only air pollution from cars and such, but also the forest fires uh, recently in Australia and California, uh, and how that affects wine and the taste of wheat. 
uh, but even in Hong Kong and the US, how the uh, tear gas that's being used right now affects what you might be eating down the road. So air water kind of exists everywhere. Doing this research, we wanted to get more precise and we couldn't travel all over the world and contribute to pollution ourselves. Uh, so Nicola Twilley visited um, the smog synthesizer lab uh, at UC Riverside in California. Uh, this is a big chamber you can see that's um, pumped full of chemicals that go in these nozzles. And that combination of chemicals is exposed to uh, UV uh, light and that kind of simulates uh, smog. Uh, and so when we learned about this lab, uh, we asked if we can make our own smog synthesizer. Uh, the scientists were very generous and gave us some early sketches and concepts. Uh, we took that forward and uh, made our own smog synthesizer, which meant that we could not only synthesize smog uh, from different locations, but also from different times. And so here you can see our recipe for the London uh, pea super smog uh, that started the industrial revolution. Um, and so now using the smog synthesizer, we could uh, use some simple uh, home chemicals and combine them uh, to make smogs in a chamber. And here you can see two images of what the smog actually looks like. So you can, you can physically see it. And then when you get up close, you can taste and smell it. And here we were pairing smog from uh, like Mexico City or from Los Angeles with street foods that um, uh, take place in those cities. Uh, of course, we want to uh, take care of our lungs uh, with long exposure to the smog that we make. So when we produce it and expose ourselves for long durations, we started to wear uh, masks and gloves. Um, and uh, this is how we use the smog synthesizer. Uh, we since moved away from this technique, but at the time it was really important to be able to get precise with the research. We took the smog synthesizer uh, all over the world to uh, COP21, looking at climate change and how that relates to local air pollution, but also serving at the health ministers of the World Health Organization, which was kind of one of the most unique uh, audiences we've ever had. Um, one person said, my throat hurts. And we explained to them like, yes, you just ate smog. Um, so you might be asking if this could make you sick. And what we've kind of learned is that our digestive system is much uh, better at dealing with these toxins than our respiratory system. And many of us breathe this air every single day of our lives. So having a little nibble won't kill you. Here are the packages from smog that's sent around the world and collected using these kits. And so we've started to use the mail system to share the taste of air pollution across different cities. We send out a kit, uh, people collect smog from their own cities and then send it back, uh, exchanging it through the mail or sending it to a centralized location. So most recently, these smog harvesters you see here collected smogs from their cities and sent them to Washington DC uh, at the World Wildlife Fund where different scientists and policymakers got to ex uh, expose themselves to the taste and smell of air pollution from around the world. And each city has a different flavor and smell based on the mix of pollutants that are present. Um, so most recently in Hong Kong, um, which notoriously has uh, very difficult air pollution challenges, it was added to by the fires and the uh, tear gas that was being used uh, in the protest. And we happened to be there when the protests were at their most intense. So it was a fairly uh, unique moment to uh, look closely at how those different um, aspects affect air quality. And most recently during COVID, we've been doing guided smog smellings. Um, people who cannot leave their houses, we've been releasing videos and audio tracks to help them go to their rooftops or open a window and experience the sort of unique atmospheric moment we're living through where localized air pollution has reduced dramatically. And this is our hope for the future and where Wabi Sabi comes in for us, our imperfect um, use of resources and um, our polluted air, we hope is going down in the future. And we've already seen some cities uh, reach peak air pollution, uh, but now we need to work at the global le level and uh, create a more um, tasty and beautiful air for all of us. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Kohei Aramaki from Dubai. I'm an actor and a contemporary dancer from Japan. Uh, my wife, Tomomi, is also a contemporary dancer. But unfortunately today that she has a class, she cannot make it. So I take you to only by myself. Um, we moved to Dubai in 2016 and joined the Shima Contemporary Dance Company in Al Sakar Avenue. So let me begin with the introduction of our recent work titled the Mizuo, which was performed performed at the Shima Contemporary Dance Studio in 2018, two years ago. 
Uh, it was a very short dance piece, around 10 minutes. It inspired by a poem called Hiroshima Child, written by Turkish poet Natsumi Hikmet. So dance piece Mizo was like an uh, exploration of emotional movements, which Hiroshima people had gotten through during the war time. But uh, it was also our personal questions related to our identities, like uh, who we are or the, from where we came from, what we do uh, in our incredibly fragile lifetime. Um, when it comes to wabi-sabi concepts, I'm very honestly speaking as one of the Japanese who has naturally grown up in a wabi-sabi culture, for me, it's very hard to define the meaning of wabi-sabi because uh, wabi-sabi is for us, it's kind of something a feeling rather than something being spoken. But for today's presentation, I will try to take you through how traditional wabi-sabi concepts in completion and imperfection concepts can be translated into body movements and how wabi-sabi concepts can be visually uh, represented by body language. So first of all, um, incompletion concept of wabi-sabi uh, can be translated into, I believe, fluid and seamless body movements. Um, fluid seamless body movements um, allow dancers to remove boundaries between human body and nature. That's what I'm always looking, looking for. So like this picture, sorry, like the picture and the dancers are dancing in the uh, rice field. Dancers can be wind or dancers body can be waves of ocean or dancers can be swinging trees in the wind or blooming flower. Um, these photos I've shown, sorry, uh, one after another were taken when my wife Tomomi joined a series of uh, experimental dance film projects by Art Fission in Singapore. She traveled around the East Asian countries like uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, Thai, and Japan, Niigata, which is hometown of, uh, of my wife. Uh, and then film crew members filmed dancers' movements in the midst of nature. So Tomomi, our dance, Tomomi and other dancers dance in the beautiful golden rice field, or they dance in a Solomon abandoned temple like this. Um, sometimes in a plain small bridge over the river where only local people usually access. So when dancers' body language is harmonized with environment, uh, harmony is a very good word to uh, explain uh, concept of Zen and the concept of wabi-sabi. So when dancers' body language is harmonized with the environment, dancers' body becomes a piece of anonymous nature, like uh, rusty wood or plain grass, even the clouds in the blue sky and the water in the river. Their bodies turn into like a piece of jigsaw puzzle, I believe. Just one tiny piece of jigsaw puzzle but once all pieces, including dancer's body, are connected each other in perfect balance, so I believe it becomes something else. You can tell the, how beautiful the world is. So this is where the wabi-sabi concept comes in. Now all pieces is perfect, but only when those pieces are beautifully put together, every single piece starts shining. So this picture is about improvisation, which is another form of contemporary dance. And also we can find a strong connection with wabi-sabi concepts too. Improvisation, as you may know, the intuitive irregular dance style. It has no specific form. It has no clear line between audience and the dancers. 
it has no specific ends of performance. I would say the improvisation is like a continuous communication with the surrounding environment. See how beautiful the photo is. So dancer are actually the communicating with the everything around the heart. So shrine and the island and the sea and the sands. Dancers react slowly moving crowds. Dancers respond sound of bells from local temples. So in that way, dancers get harmonized with the universe. So fundamental improvisation, abundance being perfect. So that's why I, I feel uh, improvisation also another strong form to connect with the world. So I quickly explained how Wabi-Sabi concepts are visually represented by body movements. But as explained before, Wabi-Sabi concept should be something feeling rather than being spoken. So as such, when COVID-19 restriction, restriction is lifted, I wish I could see you at theater and you may feel Wabi-Sabi concepts through our dance performance. Thank you so much for today. Hello. <clears throat> hello, hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Nima Nabavi. I'm a geometric artist. I make all my artwork by hand and I use pens, rulers, lots of mathematical calculations and layers and layers of hand-drawn lines to create these artworks. By the very nature of the work that I make, perfection is a big part of it. Uh, mathematical accuracy is very important. Every line needs to go to very exact points down to the millimeter, but at the same time, no two lines can ever be drawn the same. And I know that the handmade element of it um, gives that pulse and texture to the piece that really adds to the geometric effect that's brought on by the mathematical accuracy. So for me with my work, I always find myself on a spectrum between making work that appears too perfect, like you see here with our little robot guy um, that may appear soulless and machine made or on the other side of the spectrum work that's too imperfect where it ends up looking sloppy. So it doesn't have that geometric effect I'm looking for. Somewhere in between these two is the sweet spot for me. In order to do that, I define imperfections and errors. Imperfections for me is an example like this. This is 16 by 16 grid. It's mathematically accurate, but not all the lines are exactly the same and not all the spaces between them are the same. So I have to be zen about something like this, like my friend in the orange tank top. But errors are a different story. Errors are lines that are incorrectly drawn, lines that are missing, squiggly lines. And like my buddy in the blue sweatshirt, I can't accept errors in my work because of the unique nature of the way they work. Any error made in, in one of these pieces can tend to cascade throughout the whole artwork. An example is this piece over here, which I drew one single line incorrectly. It was supposed to go from that green arrow to the other green arrow. Instead, the line went from the green arrow to the red arrow, a difference of only 12 millimeters, but I had to stop the work and throw it out because a small error like this, because of the nature of the work, the lines are all interconnected. So one small error like you see here, can appear again and again within two inches. So in order to protect against these kinds of mathematical errors, I've come up with a bunch of different methodologies to make sure there's as much accuracy as possible so that any other deviation is welcome in the piece. One of the things I use a lot is I do these big layouts with post-it notes. Um, first of all, to create a delineation of where the drawing that I'm working on currently will be, but also the post-it notes give me a space to make a lot of notes and make demarcations and list all the different colors where they're going to be exactly. So I know that all the lines that I draw and all the colors that I draw are going to be completely accurate. So anything else that comes out of it, any variation is a welcome variation, a welcome texture. Another way I try to control the output of the artwork is with all the pens that I use, I bundle them and I label them so I know exactly how much each pen has been used and what artwork they've already been used on so that when I need to use them again, I'm using consistent pens with the same amount of 
fading, so to speak. Even in the colors that I use, I test out all the pens because even if you take the same color pen from the same company, you can see as the example here that slightly different shades in each um, pen may exist. So I group them according to the most consistent colors. Again, trying to control the deviations as much as possible so only the welcome imperfections show up. Another thing I do is I number all my pens and I rotate them out in a sequential order so that they all actually fade at the same even level throughout the piece. Again, another way of trying to control the output um, so that the textures that remain are what was meant to be there the whole time. Um, an example of this is this artwork where I use the 32 pens uh, to make it all evenly sequentially rotated, but you can still see there's randomness in there. There's a smoky texture to it. And that to me is very welcome. That's the kind of imperfection I like to see. I controlled as much as I could and the rest I let go. This is an example of overcorrecting for perfection. This paper had a tiny blemish on it and it was from the factory. I could have continued the artwork and no one would have noticed it. Instead, I kept erasing this tiny blemish until it totally ruined the paper. And after two weeks of drawing, um, the end result ended up being very obvious, the blemish and almost the stain to it as well. I ended up again throwing this piece out because I felt that that nervous energy of trying to over perfect and ending up with this kind of blemish is just something that I didn't want to deal with. I didn't, I didn't like that outcome. Um, in trying to think about what perfection is, I always think of the example of a billiard ball which ostensibly is a perfect representation of a geometric form, the sphere. It seems to be perfectly smooth, perfectly round. But when you magnify even a brand new billiard ball, you can see all the blemishes that exist on it. And through a super microscope, you can see even on a 3D contour map of it, it has peaks and valleys and it's far from what we might call perfect. I think our ideas of perfection often come from the modern world, from an industrialized world, from standardized items that are supposed to be used interchangeably with one another, like we see in tools, for instance. So the example here would be the hexagon with the nuts and bolts with identical hexagons. But a hexagon is also a shape that's naturally emergent in nature and in beehives and snowflakes. We see hexagons, not identical to one another, but perfect in their own ways. So I think that ultimately perfection is something that we all need to define for ourselves the meaning of. For me in my artwork, I like to have an intention and I like to execute on that intention with as much integrity as possible. But I also like to know that at a certain point, I have to relinquish control and just let go and whatever imperfections remain are the ones that were supposed to be there the whole time. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. What I'm sharing are pictures we get from clients every once in a while after they receive their bikes from Cherry Cycles. And the reason I'm proudly sharing a dent in a mudguard of a newly made Cherry Cycle is because over the past six years, we have been making a living from upcycling. We take things that look rusty and old and turn them into these beautiful, colorful pieces that are functional and they give back and without fail, every once in a while, we get this message or email saying, I have a dent in my bike. And my answer is always, yes, I know, we keep them there on purpose uh, to make you realize that imperfection happens and they are part of the journey of these bikes. Your ride will never be perfect and it may be beautiful but it's going to, and it's going to flow, but it's never going to flow perfectly. And what this business and our other most recent business has taught me is to embrace the imperfections of life. I realized that we as human beings are some of the most imperfect creatures on this planet, and yet we constantly demand perfection. Uh, and it's because we're, we're raised like that, for me at least. Uh, I grew up in a house where my mom would constantly ask, ask me, is this the jeans you're wearing to go out? And she seems extremely uncomfortable even touching it. Um, and my dad always expected straight A's, you know, we're groomed to find the perfect house, the, the perfect, raise the perfect children, find the perfect husband or wife, and we're constantly being fed that. So when disaster strikes, uh, we become extremely disheveled and uncomfortable, and we don't know what to do with ourselves. 
And it's because we often never hear or speak of people struggling. We always see the people who succeed, who reach the top, uh, or you know, we, they reach the top and then they tell us about their struggles. But I've never dealt with anybody or interviewed anyone who was actually tripping and failing over and over again. And it's because whether through our schooling or our upbringing, we're always shown this picture of a mountain and it's almost easy to touch the tip of that mountain. You don't see that mountain up close. You don't see the people that are trying very hard and failing over and over again, whether to improve themselves or improve their relationships or make a business work. And because when you're in the thick of it, you never think about if you're going to reach the top. And this is me three years ago, actually. I, in this picture, I had extremely low self-esteem. I was depressed. I was barely eating. I was unemployed and I felt useless. And what, Although it was a super tough period in my life, it helped me to learn how to smile through the struggle. It's because I realized it's delusional to try to think that the world is perfect and that there is no struggle. And there's a, because there's a great deal of misalignment in the flow of things, right? We are imperfect, the universe is imperfect and nature is imperfect. And yet we live in these very symmetrical kind of straight buildings. Uh, thinking we're ever going to reach perfection, but it's like swimming against a stream that you're never going to beat. And looking back, I realized my sister and I, and she's my partner, that we always tried to reach perfection before we shared our ideas or our businesses. But now as we grow older, especially in business, we're launching every product we have when it's 80% ready. Our bikes and cafe is, is completely upcycled. It's not fitted out. You know, we have dents in our bikes. And when people walk into cave or upcycled cafe for the very first time, the first thing they say is this place is so real because real equals imperfect and imperfect doesn't necessarily equal ugly. And we have to shift that perception because life has waves. And what I realized is these waves actually allow oxygen to enter the depths of the ocean. And waves are to my life what disasters are to, to the world. It doesn't feel good when you're being hit right, left, and center. But sometimes if you just let things go, lie on your back, and try to make peace with or accept the fact that there are waves, you'll actually float and maybe even enjoy it. And I can certainly say working with my sister has been very competitive, very challenging. But I enjoy it tremendously, no matter how many fights we have. You know, we're not always smiling like this. Uh, it's very tough to work with a sibling. And uh, it does not equal, imperfection does not equal sloppiness. It equals trying your best, constantly improving, but it does not equal sloppiness, whether it's in your relationships or your business or on yourself. And it's understanding that things are ever changing. Perfection is only momentary and it's overrated. I would rather do what feels good rather than, than what feels perfect. And I think this was touched on this art of Kintsugi where the Japanese actually glued together broken pottery with, with gold. And it's almost like them telling us wear your scars because they actually make you who you are. You know, they're highlighting this journey of hurt, of failure, of imperfection because it makes a difference. Um, and art is one of the most important things that comes out of strife and hardship and heartbreak actually. It's one of the life's biggest inspirations. Imperfection is one of art's biggest inspirations, and yet we fight it. Uh, this is made by a resident artist at Cave. Uh, she's from Gaza, and she made this during the time of Corona. And it's actually making peace with the fact that shit is going to hit the fan at any second you're in your life. And we have to be humble enough to realize that some things are not within our control. And we can make cleaning up the shit, you know, an opportunity to learn and actually have fun. Or we can look at that room, close the door and never deal with it until it stinks up our whole life. I always say whenever something bad happens to me, I have a chance to either cry and complain or I can maybe cry, crack a joke and laugh it off and even laugh at myself because, you know, you can't control it. Things are going to happen and you can either laugh or cry. And I prefer laughing because it makes me feel better. So the next time you look at a tilted painting, um, maybe tilt your head rather than try to fix it or just stand there uncomfortably and realize that it's all about perspective and trying to constantly reach perfection is an unattainable, ridiculous goal. Uh, it's almost as ridiculous as saying, you know, I was born with only one dimple in my face and I can look at myself every morning going like, oh, my face is not symmetrical. Or I can look at the hole in my cheek and say, it makes me unique. I'm running and I'm proudly disheveled and that's what makes my life beautiful.
Thank you. Thank you, Rania. That was awesome. Um, my name is Walid Shah. I'm a photographer. Um, and sometimes I do uh, personal projects like Rock Your Ugly. Rock Your Ugly was uh, born out of a very uh, dark place in my life where I lost a friend. Um, and uh, I was also uncomfortable with my body. That, that, those two things kind of married together. And I kind of explored the intersection between you know, mental and physical health. It started off when I posted a photo of myself uh, holding my belly, just saying that, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with my body. I was a bodybuilder before, and now this is what it looks like, but I'm, I'm, I'm not in a place where I can do something about it. Uh, check back in next year. So I explored uh, you know, different people's feelings towards their bodies, and I just wanted to show uh, the, different, uh, the different sides of the story. On the right, you've got Tiny that's not super comfortable with his body, trying to lose weight, but still advocating for plus size models. And on the left tack where he's like, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with my body. I've been built, I've been skinny, but you know, this size of body is actually what I'm comfortable in. Same thing, kind of same stories with both Karina and, and, and Joe on the right and left where, you know, one is super comfortable with her body and one is kind of like trying to kind of change it. Uh, but you wouldn't know that when you see them. Uh, these three images compare eating disorders where on the surface you think these people look great and pretty but they have actually gone through and some of them came out and some of them didn't come out of an eating disorder um, issue um, and they talk about it in depth in their stories. Uh, you know, going back to, to, to different stories where on the left and right you've got uh, post-pregnancy, post post-birth uh, issues where Azza on the right just you know doesn't feel like she's at her ideal weight and uh, on the left uh, you know you can see clearly the scar from a c-section um, this image kind of shows you the difference between uh, women that have have a different idea of breast sizes where on the left um, Nivea had a breast reduction but on the on, in the middle um, uh, she didn't, or on the right she she doesn't feel like a woman because of the size of her breast. But they all have scars to show for it. Um, and then here you've got some some stories of those three women have been told that they are going to probably die a few times, um, and they've come out of it uh, alive. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully as as far as I know. But they, you know, they're all they're all healthy and happy just now. Um, over here, you've got uh, Hanan on the left that suffered from scoliosis and had the surgery and has a scar to show for it, where Laura on the right has scoliosis and decided, you know what, I'm not having the surgery, I'm keeping that curve in my back that's part of me. Um, and she just kind of moved forward from there. Uh, stories of vitiligo, uh, you've got uh, you know, both Lujaina and Mahmoud from, from Cairo uh, being sort of discriminated against as kids because of vitiligo, because of this coloration on their skin, but coming out uh, stronger as adults uh, and finding their voice in the community. Another, another issue that we don't see very often in our community is alopecia, where you, you lose patches of your hair. Um, and both of these women have, have uh, gone through that and come out the other side. And they both say the same thing, where alopecia is like a chosen disorder, where you're chosen to have alopecia because of the burden it carries. Uh, these two stories are of uh, sexual abuse. Uh, and I think it's something that we don't talk about in our community, or in any community, really. It's sort of a shameful uh, story to talk about. But these two women were, were brave enough to, to share their stories and kind of normalize talking about their abuse. So um, you know, th these are sort of stories that I wanted to just show you uh, to compare uh, two different sides of stories. But the, the, the key messages here to take away from this project are, one, if you're going through something, you're probably not the only one. And it's OK to feel what you're feeling and to talk about it, have that conversation, talk to your friends, talk to a therapist. Uh, second is for the people who, who, who sort of you know, maybe aren't go through, going through something. Uh, to make fun of somebody for something, especially kids in high school or as adults, that stuff hurts. That stuff, you know, you, you carry that stuff with you all through adulthood and it affects you in your life. 
And finally, the, the, the most important message is for the parents, where uh, what I see is parents are using more rather than the well-being of their child. So, um, so uh, you, you know, the, the, the best thing to do for parents is to, to focus on the well-being of the child rather than, you know, shaming them or trying to hide the story uh, from from society and uh, and help the child get through it and normalize having these conversations um, in, 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 a, in a safe space because as parents and as family that's what we're here for um, so the, the the product is called rock your ugly the book is out you can find it on Amazon you can find it on my website as well it's uh, the, the slide will come up just now it's Waleed Chat on AE um, check that out there's an ebook as well uh, my 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 favorite thing to do is for you to 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 see the image with the story as well because the the image is something that society perceives versus the story where it's a lot you know it's a lot deeper than that that image so um please do check out the book uh like i said it's on amazon and and my website and finally i just wanted to share you know the sort of the before and after i didn't lose any weight here i just kind of gained my confidence through all these sessions with different people telling me their stories um, and that's sort of you know my confidence back after having all these therapy sessions uh, thank you so much guys for having me i really appreciate your time um, again walid uh, to get the book uh, ebook or hardcover and over to zainab Hi, um, my name is Camilo Cerro, and um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a professor of architecture and interior design at the American University of Sharjah. Um, today, I'm going to use this opportunity um, to talk about a different aspect of Wabi Sabi. Um, and um, Normally, when we when we confront Wabi Sabi, Wabi Sabi is, a, is, a, is an idea that comes out of Buddhism. And uh, we've been um, in all of the last presentations, which have been awesome, by the way, uh, we've been talking a lot about the imperfection, but I'm really, especially because of the times that we are living on, I'm much more interested in permanence. Um, the uh, Corona coaster we've been living through has uh, made us aware of our impermanence. It's made us understand that life is finite and we live in a world where we hide this constantly. Um, so if you're like me, you've been thinking a lot about things um, and introspecting through this whole process. Uh, because I'm an architect, um, I'm gonna use this opportunity to talk about how impermanence can be dealt with from an architectural perspective. One of the first things that have come through for me is the idea that to survive these times, those that live in community, whether that's a family of blood or a family that you've created, um, have functioned much better than those that don't. So in my prediction for the future, which is what I do for a living in terms of how we're going to live, um, I'm going to present to you that uh, there's going to be a move towards living more in community and more so to have a simple life. We're going to be looking for a life that gives us a space and space of mind to be able to spend more time with the people we want to spend time because there is no guarantee that Bill or us will be there tomorrow. And this starts by reducing the size of our houses. A large house requires money, energy, and time to maintain. Um, and this is time you're not using for the things you want to do in life. The smaller the house, um, the, uh, the less you're going to have to clean. And through this process, you'll have more time to um, do whatever you want with it. Um, we also have to understand that a smaller house creates less debt and involves less risk, especially with the economical troubles that we're going to have as a repercussion for the moment we're living in. 
a cheaper house will make a gigantic difference for uh, millennial and post millennials um, that are moving into the markets right now. Also, a smaller house allows for better social interaction. You will have to go out more. You will have to meet your neighbors, creating that sense of community that I, talk, that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and to do this, um, the houses are going to be designed in such a way that uh, you're going to have to, um, because of the limited space, be much more careful choosing the things that go into your house. You're not going to be decorating for the sakes of decorating. Your house will become a museum of your life. Um, as houses become smaller, they will also be more affordable, which at the end, they mean, this means that they're also going to be easier to sell because there's going to be a, a larger amount of population being able to afford these houses. And uh, because a smaller house consumes less materials, and uh, functions in a very different way than a larger house, the environmental impact that it generates is going to be different. Um, and that is something that we need to be very aware of um, uh, at, at this time. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that um, the less we have, the more mentally liberated we're going to be. And it's going to be very interesting to see what we do with that extra time at our disposal. And uh, because of uh, global warming and the type of uh, lives that the, the new generations are going to have to be dealing with, maybe a lot of that time will be used towards um, a life of self-sufficiency. Um, the house of the future will be a place where you can live, work, and farm so that you're not dependent on others, so that communities get stronger by functioning together. So um, in a way, um, this also will be a response to the problems of urban density that we're going to be confronted with very shortly. Right now, 60% of the population of the planet lives in cities, and that number will jump to 75 within the next decade. Um, we need um, to be able to control our space much better. But by doing so, we'll gain time and peace of mind to do, learn, spend time with the people that we want and we love. So impermanence, is opening our eyes to thinking about how to use our lives in a better way. Thanks everybody that presented. Thanks for letting me be part of this presentation and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much to our speakers and presenters for these wonderful, inspiring, um, and in some, some, some ways awe-inspiring um, presentations. Thank you again. Um, it was really wonderful for you to join us and make the time from all over the world. Um, in general, everyone else, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you back on Ulcer Call Online and on the avenue soon, we hope, for more exciting experiences as we continue to embrace the imperfect. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much.